I am I'm very excited that we're going to be able to start our new series here and as, as we, uh, we make a push to renew our commitments to the Lord and to one another and we seek to grow vertically in our relationship with the Lord that we may support of the work that he's called us to as a church and we may continue to build on a foundation that this may be a worshiping congregation and a body uh, for as long as the Lord tarries. We're going to start... Um, sort of at square one, and I'm not going to make any apologies for being overly simple. We will uh, take sort of a 30,000-foot flyby, and then we'll come down and we'll follow this. And in our new series, we're going to uh, look at an overview of Scripture that we may understand how the whole thing fits together and of its importance that we may make sense out of any part of Scripture in light of the whole of Scripture. And uh, you're never too young or old to do this. And uh, the first time I went through a series like this, I was incredibly blessed, and uh, that was just a a few years ago, and I'd been studying for quite some time. So I think that this will be a blessing. Some parts, uh, as I said before, uh, they're simple enough that our kids uh, can certainly make sense out of this, and I think that we'll all grow from this. And before we start, then, let's give our attention to the Word of God. I want to read from uh, the 19th Psalm, if you want to look at that with me. You can turn to Psalm 19. We're just going to read that whole psalm there, although there's a particular section from about 7 to 12 or or 11 that uh, I think may come more to mind as we study God's Word this morning. Psalm 19 reads this way. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Almighty God, we do come to your word. We come that we may grow in the knowledge of your will and the knowledge of you, and we may walk lives that are worthy of the calling with which we've been called, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work, that as we come to know you and be known by you, Father, our faith might be grown, that we'd be encouraged and strengthened to live more like Christ, to be used of you to accomplish your perfect will, that you may receive all glory and honor and praise for in all things, You are supreme. Guide us now as we learn, Father. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are a number of places that we could start, and I want to remind you that it's it's we are not uh, we're not going to give up on the exposition, verse by verse of God's word. But this is a sort of a purposeful detour in a sense, from that method, so that when we come back down to God's word verse at a time, we may have a place to set things in. You know, it always uh, is a little surprising. The first time that you show a kid a globe, 
or, or a map, right? To say, well, here's our house, but then here's our house in the middle of this whole big city. And they think that's kind of neat. They see how we fit in. and Oh, we're on that side of town or this side of town. And then when you show them a map of, of, of the state, perhaps, and oh, well, there's, there's much more going on than just our little house or our little town. And you expand out to the country. And then you show them a globe and you think, Wow, that is, that is fascinating. And here we are, this tiny little dot, this place that you couldn't even see in this whole big world. And then they begin to get curious and they look up into the sky and they think, what's going on out there? And we look through a telescope and we look at astronomy maps or we go to a planetarium and we just think, my goodness, all of this declares what an amazing and a glorious God we have. How far beyond our comprehension? I mean, the primary meaning of what it means that God is holy is not that he is just morally clean and perfect, though he is. The larger sense of which that is meant is that he is altogether other. He is transcendent. He is not like us, and we are not like him. He is far and away above and beyond something different and separate and holy than us. The grandeur of all that he's made is shocking when we begin to look at the huge scope of what he's done. Well, when we come to God's word, a lot of us have our favorite passages. We have our favorite stories. Maybe, I don't know, some of you, if you grew up uh, in a little church like I did in Sunday school where you had like those, those flannel graph things where the felt like it's, <laughs> some of you are nodding, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, you, you know, those images are just burned into your mind like that must be what Noah looked like. <laughs> Um, it's interesting, you know, we just got back from the Ark and from the Creation Museum and they have made models. Of course, we have no idea what Adam looked like. Right? We have no idea of what uh, Noah looked like. We don't know exactly what the Ark looked like, but we've done our best and they've done their best. But it, it's something to behold it all together, right? to see how it all fits together. And that is part of our goal. And uh, I'm going to lean heavily heavily, right? If I give you my source material, you'll see exactly where this came from. I'm not making any attempt to plagiarize or write this off as anything unique or original to me. It's not. This is extremely daunting. I wondered if I should even do this, but I think that it's so important for us to understand what we're dealing with when we have this Bible open. We need to know how it fits together and we need to be people who understand just like location matters in real estate, context matters with scripture. Not just in a sentence or a paragraph or a passage or a book, but the whole book, cover to cover, the whole thing, which is in a sense a library of different books written by 40 or so authors over about 2,000 years. But in another sense, it is one book with one ultimate author with one ultimate story. And so today we're just going to take sort of a, a, a broad 30,000 foot flyby and I'm going to try to, to pull the thread from one end of the Bible to the other and then we'll come back down and we'll start doing one section at a time just to kind of give you a heads up where we, where we are. And so I'm just asking that you'd be gracious with me, that you guys would be uh, active and attentive, that you would ask questions, that you'd be thinking, that you would... Uh, I really seek that the Lord would grow you in your understanding. Just to go on the back of what we read from the Old Testament, and there are many places we could have gone. We could have gone to Psalm 119. That is a tremendous psalm that has a lot to say about God's Word. I want to also uh, remind you of a couple scriptures that I think will come to mind a number of times, and just so you can jot them down if you didn't know where they were. In 2 Timothy, this is Paul's last letter, and he's reminding Timothy of all the most important things. And in the third chapter, some of you know exactly where we're going here. Second Timothy 3, Paul writes in verse 16, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Scripture is sufficient. We believe that. It is inspired. It is inerrant, it is infallible, and it is sufficient for the man and woman of God to do what God has called us to do. But it is not something that we came up with on our own. And Peter is also led to write something that I think goes very well on the back of that in Second Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Second Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes this, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not to say that God dictated things. Um, I think it was uh, Warfield who said once that you know, if God, when God desired to write a, uh, a letter in the style of someone like Apostle Paul, he found the Apostle Paul to write that. So in a sense, you, you and he ensures that what they wrote as real genuine human beings was exactly what he wanted it to be. But you hear Paul. You, you, you know the difference between when you're reading Peter or John or Paul or Moses or David. And those are God-inspired words by the Holy Spirit. These men carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting thing. We, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. But we understand first and foremost that what we come to when we come to Scripture, this is God's revelation of himself. It includes history. It includes poetry. It, inclo- it includes all kinds of things. But this is the inspired word from our creator to his creation. So we want to know how all these parts fit together. What is the role of each part of what we would call special revelation? So natural revelation would be that which about David was writing where creation screams out, there's a God, there's a God. And Romans says that we understand his divine nature and his eternal power, but that's not enough that we would understand how to be saved. We don't know about salvation. We don't know about Jesus Christ. We're not told about all that, but we do know for sure from looking at what is out there that God does exist. So there's natural revelation, then this is what we would consider special revelation. And how does it all fit together? So our goal would be to understand all that, to see God's plan of redemption, of being unfolded, to understand how genre and context and history uh, help us understand what they were saying. These things were written to real people in a real time, in a real day and age, in real history. And we need to understand what it meant to them as they were reading it. Paul didn't write these things and seal them away in a jar so that 2,000 years later somebody then could finally read it. No, he was writing to real people and they would have understood things. And us, 2,000 years removed from the history, from the culture, from the context, sometimes we can be guilty of reading our own personal culture and context and forcing it onto the Bible and trying to make sense of it in some sort of 21st century American way. We need to understand what God was writing and that he used real people in real history in real time. That's why we have that Apostles' Creed. This faith is grounded and rooted in genuine history. Pontius Pilate was a real person. Mary was a real person who lived at a specific point in time. And so we want to understand how all this fits together. And ultimately, we want to grow in our knowledge of God and our love for him. We need to understand how all the parts make sense in light of the whole. So let's just start then with this, uh, and again, th- this may seem overly simple to some of you, and, and uh, I'm not going to apologize for that because my hope is also that we're going to have uh, kiddos coming in and we're going to have some of us who have been at this for a while, and uh, it's good for us. It's good for us. So the layout, there's 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. There's somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of about 40 human writers. As you may hear the word author. There's a human author, but ultimately there is one a divine author of all of these things. And we, we looked at how both Paul and Peter were led to testify to that, that this is God-breathed. Uh, if you go to your table of context, if you have your Bible there, and if you've never done this before, if you go to the table of context, contents, sorry, not table of context, the table of contents, just, just to give us, again, a, a broad overview of a roadmap. So what are we looking at? So we start in Genesis, and from there to about Esther, you have history, or, or, yeah, Ruth in there, Esther is, uh, is a little bit later, but you, you have history, basically, from, from Genesis to Esther. After Esther, you go from Job to Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, and, and that is poetry and wisdom literature, so this is where the Psalms are. Um, Job is, you know, we, we confess, we believe that was a genuine person, but that book is written in a, in a sort of a poetic or a play type style. That doesn't mean that it's fiction. It doesn't mean that it's false. But it does help us understand the way in which it's to be understood and, and some of the things that are in there. Then after you get to Song of Songs, right, from Isaiah all the way to the end, you have prophecy, the prophets. From Isaiah all the way to Malachi, you have the prophets. That's the Old Testament. And 
it's important that we understand the New Testament in a very real sense presupposes in many places a knowledge of the old. We're going we're to see that as we go forward. So when you get to the New Testament, you have, of course, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the, the record of Jesus' life and teaching. Then you have the Acts, which is sort of uh, the history book of, of the early church. Some might call it the Acts of the Apostles. It's probably better known as the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Then you have the letters. Most of them are written by Paul. Uh, you have a couple by Peter, one by James. You have three of them by John, one by Jude. Nobody uh, is for sure the author of Hebrews didn't identify himself. And then you have at the end an apocalyptic vision given to the Apostle John um, by God. That is the revelation. That's, that's the map of the book. And the Bible is, in a sense, both one book and a very diverse library of writings. And we need to consider each part in light uh, of the other parts and in light of the whole big picture. So there's one book, there's one ultimate author, um, and there's one subject. One subject, that is Jesus Christ and the salvation that God provides through him. That has always been the plan. Many have wrongly assumed that the plan in the Old Testament was that people should be saved by obeying the law and that when that failed, then God instituted a new plan to save them by grace through faith in his Son. Nothing could be further from the truth. The plan has always been salvation by grace through faith in God's promise. Now, from the Old Testament... They look forward to Christ, believing as Abraham did in God's promise. From the New Testament, you stand and Christ is there. And where we are, we stand back and look at the same promise, but we have the benefit of seeing what God had done. They had to look forward, trusting that God would do what he said he done. But it's always been the same promise from cover to cover. One way of salvation, even Jesus said in John 5, right? Talking about the Old Testament. These are the scriptures that testify about me. And in Luke, remember, on the road to Emmaus, and, and they were confused, and, and they didn't know that Jesus was walking with them. And what does he tell them? He starts with Moses and the prophets and goes, what a sermon, right? I wish, wish we'd had that recorded for us. And explains to them how the entire Old Testament told them exactly that he was the Messiah. He explained, here's what I said, here's what was written, and they understand that it's about him. So the promise is made in the Old Testament. And then it moves to fulfillment. That is the general sweep of all of Scripture. There is a promise, and God fulfills his promise. That's the overarching kind of way that this is laid out. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, we're, we're told by Paul that all of the promises of God find their yes and their amen. In other words, their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that the second I ask for something, if I say in Jesus' name, I'm going to get it. What he's saying is there everything that God promised. Everything is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the supreme central character of all of Scripture and all of creation. So this is, a, in a sense, not to be separated. If you take just the Old Testament, it is a story that has a promise but has no ending. It's like a murder mystery. If you read the first part, you know someone died. You might know how they died, but you never find out who did it. If you take the New Testament and you forget about the Old, you, you have a story that needs a beginning. You, you, you know that the butler did it, but you don't know what he did. What did the butler do, right? You, you need both parts together. The Old Testament is a promise that the Messiah will come, and the New Testament is the proclamation that the Messiah has come in the person of Jesus Christ. It's, it's not a collection of random quotations and nice little verses. I mean, we can quote scripture in verse, right? The New Testament writers often quoted scripture, not entire books at a time. Often by quoting a verse, they were referring back to the entire context in which that verse came out of. But it is one book, one story from beginning to end. What is the best then and most helpful way to unlock or to understand a theme uh, by which we could organize this book? We, we haven't done that yet. We, we know... What it is, we've seen now how it's kind of laid out, but what's the most helpful theme or the, the motif or the thread uh, to unlock and make sense out of this, a framework, if you will. And uh, there are two things that have to be true about a framework that you're going to use to make sense out of something like this. One, when it comes to Scripture, that framework has to be established 
from or by Scripture, not imposed upon Scripture. It needs to be something that when you read this book, clearly comes out as a way in which the story is organized. There's one story from beginning to end. What is the theme of this story? We don't want to take a theme that we think is nice and impose it on there. It needs to come out from Scripture, right? God has done this for us. And secondly, it needs to be broad enough um, that it allows each part to fit into and make its own distinctive contribution. In other words, we need to let the Psalms do what Psalms were meant to do. We need to let the Gospels do what the Gospel were meant to do. Uh, each part giving its own distinct part of this, yet all fitting together. So the framework that, that I think is, and there are a lot of frameworks. Uh, some of them work better than others. Some of them emphasize some parts uh, more than others. Um, the framework that we're going to go with that I think will help us make sense of a lot of this is one that we've already begun uh, to be familiar with, and that is the kingdom of God. It's extremely helpful in seeing how this works, but we've got to lay out what we mean by that, and then I'm going to try and show you how that works out. Uh, this is not opposed necessarily to the idea that, uh, that the structure of Scripture is covenantal. The covenant promises that God made are, are kingdom promises. They are sort of one and the same. And so we're not trying to depart from that or, or oppose that necessarily. So Graham Goldsworthy, uh, whose work I'm relying on a lot, he and Vaughn Roberts and Alistair Begg, um, he defines the kingdom of God, and, and I've used this before, God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. God's kingdom is God's people in God's place under God's rule enjoying God's blessing. And that's not exhaustive of everything, but that, that's sufficient. That will help us guide through this. Okay. <clears throat> we ready? We're, we're going we're gonna to make a mad dash from Genesis to Revelation, God willing. We're going to try and get through this. Before we do that, I want to give you these eight categories. And they're alliterated, and that causes for some weak connections, but I like alliterated things. It helps me remember. So this is the sort of the, the, the divisions that we kind of see or the way we're going to see God's kingdom played out over the entirety of Scripture. First, there is the pattern kingdom, the kingdom pattern. Then there is the kingdom that is perished. So the, the kingdom patterned, the kingdom perished, the kingdom promised. Then the kingdom partial. And you'll see what we mean when we, when we get to each of these. Then the kingdom prophesied, that's the Old Testament. The patterned, the perished, the promised, the partial, and the prophesied. And in the New Testament, we have the kingdom present, the kingdom proclaimed, and the kingdom finally then perfected. Okay? So those eight Ps, right? Patterned, perished, promised, partial, prophesied, present, proclaimed, and perfect. We'll go back over it. I'll repeat those. You can write them down again. All right, here we go. Uh, first section, and we fly over. You know, I remember the first time I, I flew uh, overseas, and, and um, not the first time, it was actually the second time, but when I was taking my trip to Ireland, right, finally coming back home to, to my ancestors, and I looked down, and there's this giant green rock, and it is just a very green spot in the middle of the ocean. And, and I just, I, I wept in a sense, but I wanted to know what was down there specifically, right? Everything is super tiny. And so we're going to be flying kind of high to give an overview, but we will come down and look at very specific places. So, so stay tuned, okay? All right, the pattern of the kingdom. This is Genesis 1 and 2. You have God's people, that's Adam and Eve, right? In God's place, where's that? The Garden of Eden. You have God's rule. What were they, what were they doing there? They were listening to God's word. They were given his word. God's rule is God's word. His commandments, what he has decided, what he has proclaimed, what he's made known to us. And then you have them enjoying God's blessing. When they live under and submit to God's rule, that is to enjoy God's blessing. To submit to God as king is to enjoy his blessing. They were dwelling with God in peace, in his abundant provision. In a general sense, the blessing of God could be summed up as perfect relationships. Man perfectly related to God without any animosity. Man related to his environment without any uh, misuse or neglect. Everything's sort of relating together. There's no separation between God and his creation, between man and his God, between man and his creation. Everything is going like it should. That is the ultimate blessing, that God is dwelling with his people, with his creation, and there's a perfect relationship between all those things. Well, it doesn't take long then for the pattern to perish or to, to spoil. We, we, we get... Three chapters in, and all of a sudden, it's toast. Adam and Eve decide that they would be better doing things independently. 
They decide they want to reject God's rule by rejecting his word. And they choose to do it their own way. They reject his rule. They invite then God's curse, the removal of his blessing, their exile from God's place. They reject his rule. They are exiled from his place. And now instead of being in, uh, enjoying his blessing, they are under his curse and judgment. So that pattern quickly perishes. To reject God's rule, to strive for independence from God, to exalt self-rule and self-sufficiency is to reject God's blessing. It is to live under God's judgment and curse. And we'll see more of that as we study these things in depth. Then you have the kingdom promised. So if we're looking now, with, in a sense, this does start also in Genesis 3 when we have uh, God's pronouncement that he will send the seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Uh, but in a, in a larger part, we now go fast forward to about chapter 12. Despite the failure of our first parents, uh, God in his love and eternal wisdom and plan in accordance with all of his purposes and promises uh, chooses to restore his kingdom. But he doesn't do so immediately. We get to Abraham. Abraham is called uh, unconditionally by God, picked out of all the people on the earth. And he tells him that he's going to make a people for himself from Abraham's family. He is going to put them in his land, his place, and he is going to uh, give them his law that they would submit to his rule and they will enjoy his blessing. This is essentially the gospel. That's what Paul writes in Galatians 3, right? In Galatians 3, Paul says sort of a, a funny thing. If, I were to, if you were to ask most people uh, to whom was the gospel first preached, some people might say Adam and Eve, uh, but some people might say, well, um, you know, John the Baptist stepped on the scene at the beginning. But Paul says in Galatians 3, verse 8, he writes, uh, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't remember anything about like, you know, a sacrifice or a savior or even Jesus, right? At saying, so he's going to say, here, here it is. In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The gospel is essentially the good news of God's plan to restore his kingdom in which his people who submit to his rule will enjoy his blessing as they dwell together with him in his place prepared for them. God has already started that. We are called to be a people separate unto God. We are his people. We are made children in his family. His place is not yet perfected, but he does dwell with us in the Holy Spirit. We are given his rule and a heart to love his law, not be condemned by it. And we enjoy the blessing, as Paul said, right? You've been given every spiritual blessing in, in the heavenly places. God has already begun this work of restoring the kingdom. That is essentially the gospel. This promise is authored by the Father, accomplished by the Son, and applied by the Spirit. It's received by faith in Jesus Christ, applied to us by the Holy Spirit. And all of this has been sovereignly decreed by the Father. That is the gospel, the good news that God is restoring his kingdom and calling a people to himself, to live in his place, to live under his rule, and to enjoy his blessing. After this disaster in Genesis 3, that's pretty good news. So this is a partially fulfilled thing, though, uh, in, the, in, the, in the history of the nation of Israel. You have a partial kingdom. Remember uh, that uh, God calls uh, Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, right? He, he then brings them to Mount Sinai. He declares that he's going to make them his people, and what does he do? He gives them his law and proclaims that when they are living under his rule, they will enjoy his blessing in the land that he's going to take them, God's people in God's place, under God's rule, enjoying God's blessing. But this is still just a partial fulfillment. Why? Because of sin. Sin is still a problem. Uh, they do enjoy his blessing in, a, in, a, in many ways, but primarily uh, the blessing of God is the presence of God with his people. And what did they have with them? They had this tabernacle. God dwelt with his people. Moses, remember, remember when he refused to come down off the mountain? Man, if you're not going with us, we're not going because we're nothing if you don't go with us. And God said, okay, right? You're going to build me a tent, but it's going it's to stay outside. 
right? And David had longed to, to give God this temple. And he said, no, you're not going to do it, but your son will do it. So they had this partially fulfilled promise to restore this king, a glimpse, right? Pictures of what was to come. But again, the fulfillment of all this is Jesus Christ. So we're, we're, we're still before that. Then you get Joshua, you get the conquest, and you get David and Solomon. By that time of the conquest, they were living in relative prosperity and in peace. So you have God's people, the nation of Israel, God's place is the land of Canaan. The rule given to them by the law and the prophets that God used and the blessing was the peace and prosperity they enjoyed and the presence of God. But again, sin is still a problem. Disobedience brought the dismantling of the kingdom and the disappearance of that peace and prosperity because by the time Solomon dies, his sons lead to a civil war and the nation of Israel splits. You have Israel in the north and you have Judah then in the south. Now we have the prophesied kingdom. So now we're, we're getting around towards the, the last part of the Old Testament, Isaiah and all those. Okay, so there's a civil war. It's about 800 B.C. or so. All right, before 800 years or so before Christ. There's 200 years of complete separate existence before Israel in the north is captured by Assyria and destroyed. Then another 100 years or so later, uh, Judah continues to survive until they are captured and destroyed by Babylon and the inhabitants then are taken away. This is where we get Daniel. This is where we get Jeremiah. So you have, during this time, God speaking to his people through the prophets. You have people like Isaiah and Micah in the south, you have people like Amos and Hosea in the north, right? Sort of considered troublemakers, but taking God's word to the people, saying, you're supposed to be God's people living under his rule in his place, right? You didn't do that, and now you're out of the place. Sound familiar, right? I told you not to eat of that tree. Day you do, you die, and now there's a separation out of the garden. Same thing happens. Well, they eventually do come back, and they think that this is sort of the fulfillment, but it's not. The prophets had pronounced... God's punishment or judgment for sin, but also a great deal of hope for the future. They have wonderful passages like Isaiah 53 where we're told about the Messiah that's going to come, but they don't, they don't understand what they're looking for. If you look at a Jewish study Bible, they still teach that this is something to do with the nation of Israel, not the person of Jesus Christ. Well, after this all happens, then you've got about 400 years of silence. And that's where the Old Testament book ends, but it's not where the Old Testament period ends. The last Old Testament prophet actually appears in the New Testament. That's John the Baptist. He is pre-Christ. He is prophesying and proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. After 400 years, you have this crazy looking guy out in the desert warning people again, calling them to repent. So then Jesus steps on the scene. This is now the, the present kingdom. And if you remember, we saw in Matthew as we studied the Sermon on the Mount, but also if you look at the beginning of Mark, in the first chapter of Mark, I think we're going to make it, we'll see. In the first chapter of Mark, verse 15, Jesus steps on the scene and that's what he says. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We saw that before the Sermon on the Mount. What was the gospel Jesus preached? It was the gospel of the kingdom of God. I'm the king, and he displayed by his power and by his teaching that he has the power of the king and the creator. He has the authority of the king and the creator, and he has come to say the time's at hand. The kingdom is here. When he, he said, you know, you see people casting out demons, right? The kingdom of God is upon you, right? He has come, and he has conquered. But he, he chose a very interesting way of doing it, didn't he? He didn't do it the way they thought he should have done it kicking out Rome and setting everything right. He did set everything right. He did all the work that was necessary to be done, but he did it by choosing to die in humility on a cross. And they, a lot of Jews in that time, they just couldn't understand that. They couldn't see that. They weren't looking with eyes of faith at the promise. So the kingdom then is inaugurated but it's not yet consummated. It's interesting when you listen to Jesus preach that he speaks about the kingdom both in terms of an already, it's here, it's at hand, you're seeing it, and sort of a not yet, it's coming, it's not quite done yet. So we have sort of an already and a not yet thing happening. We're sort of in this weird in-between space where it has come, but it's not been finished. All the work that needed to be done to set things right was finished by Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. But the job itself isn't, completely or fully applied yet. It's not quite done. He's promised that he will come back one last time. 
The resurrection is a declaration that he was successful in his mission to do what the Father had sent him to do. And in his ascension, we have essentially a coronation. And he sets down at the right hand of the Father. And he is waiting, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, until all of his enemies should be put under his feet. He is reigning and ruling right now. He's not waiting for a throne. He's not waiting to be king. He is the king. He is reigning right now. But he's reigning from heaven at the moment. That's the present kingdom. And then we have what we're supposed to do. Then we have during this time here, these last days that we're told that we're in, the time between Christ's first coming and his second coming. We're told those are the last days. That's how the writers of Scripture refer to it. In these last days. Now you have the proclaimed kingdom. This is the reconciliation. is accomplished by but not fully applied. Right? All the elect are brought to faith as God calls kids into his family. Right? It's been done. We are proclaiming that the kingdom has come. We carry on the work. We go to all the people in all the world to proclaim Jesus Christ, teaching them to obey everything that he's commanded and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. God is calling kids into his family. And during this time, it is our duty and our privilege to proclaim the good news, the restoration and reconciliation to our maker through his son, Jesus Christ, who is reigning now from heaven and who will return again to judge. We're to live in these last days under God's rule, to enjoy his presence by the Holy Spirit, to enjoy his blessing. And as the kingdom grows, it will near its consummation. We call those who are not his people to become his people. We're given everything that we need to plant seeds, to water seeds, and to trust that it is God who makes those seeds grow. So then finally you get the perfected kingdom. And this brings us now to the end. And, I, and I've told you that we, we'll probably head into Revelation at some point. But in a, in a larger sense, it is a book that makes previously unseen spiritual things visible in a certain form or fashion. Uh, there is some history in there. There is some future in there. There is some present in there. It is a very strange and apocalyptic book. It's written in what they call apocalyptic a style, which means it's not quite poetry, but it uses imagery, it uses metaphors, it uses very Old Testament images. And if you know your Old Testament, as many of those people probably would, it doesn't seem nearly as strange as it does to those of us who look from the 21st century back without any context to that. Uh, and we need to be careful not to impose on it, coming to it with our own ideas of what we've always been told the end will be like and then make that happen in the Bible. No, we just want to read it the way it is, but we've got to understand what we are reading. It is the only book in the entire Bible which explicitly states that when you hear and read it, you're to be blessed, that you are blessed. Why should we not read it? Because people have just made a muck of it. They have just turned it into a puzzle book or some sort of strange... Uh, code and they, they've missed the blessing where God is saying, hang on to the end. I am coming. I do win. And if you preserve, uh, per persevere to the end, you will be blessed. And I have something waiting for you that you could not possibly fathom. I am the victor. And if you look at those last two verses, right? In, in, G in Genesis 1 and 2, you see this patterned kingdom. In Revelation 21 and 22, you see this completed perfect kingdom with all of God's kids from every tribe and tongue and nation all exalting the Lord Jesus Christ all the rebels all the enemies away from God's place and blessing in hell in condemnation and all of in his presence with blessing and rest it's interesting to note and we'll talk about it again but in creation Every one of those first six days ends with his morning, evening and morning was the first, second, third day. But you know what? You don't find that on day seven. It never says evening and morning was the seventh day. It's meant to continue. And it will continue. And when you get to the end, you find out it's going to continue. It's going to continue. That is how we put everything together. God's people, God's place under God's rule and blessing. No, no more sin. No more curse, no more sorrow or suffering. There is the good, the bad, the new, and the perfect. That's this book. All of it, from cover to cover, with one story, one central figure. That is Jesus Christ. 
and a salvation that God provides through, by grace through faith in him. May God grow us in our understanding of this book. We've, we've taken a quick flyby. It's not that quick, but it was quick, right? That's, that's about 2,000 years that we just covered there. <laughs> I've just written it, right? It covers more than that in history. 40 authors. Hope that you stay tuned. I know that when we get into God's word and we understand what we're dealing with and what we're holding, there is not a person who walks away unblessed by that because God's word accomplishes what he sends it forth to accomplish without fail every time. Amen. Do you believe that, church? Amen.